All right, and we're live. So I think a lot of folks are excited about tonight's stream. I have Do Kwan with me, the founder and CEO of Terraform Labs. Um, I have a few topics I want to cover, namely regulation, UST, decentralization, and the future of Terra. But before we get into that, Do, do you mind just introducing yourself briefly for those that might not be familiar? Uh, so, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Do, uh, I am the founder of Terraform Labs. Uh, we are the core developer behind Terra Money, which is a lot of different things, but it's uh, sort of a layer one platform uh, that sort of natively wraps around decentralized algorithmic stablecoins. And in this category, uh, Terra USD, which is the flagship um, stablecoin of the ecosystem, is the largest in this category. Awesome. So I think a lot of folks probably have the same first question in mind. Um, obviously, you were at Masari Mainnet. There are some rumors circulating around that the SEC approached you there. I know you you spoke to the Define or someone from your team did and said you didn't get served at Mainnet. But can you comment on whether you were approached by the SEC at Mainnet? Uh, so, I mean, we can't, you know, comment on specific regulators, but... Uh, I mean, like at our scale, we talk to regulators all over the world and we get investigated all the time, but it's uh, not a big deal. Um, although like at Mainnet, I was served with uh, lots of nice drinks. I can say that. <laughs> I saw you had a lot of fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish I was there, by the way. I'm in Boston now, but I couldn't make it up, unfortunately. But in any case, just speaking about regulation broadly, what are your thoughts there? Do you think the U.S. is overstepping boundaries? Obviously, you're not a U.S.-based company, at least Terraform Labs isn't. But what are your thoughts there? Do we need a large power like the U.S. to come in and start regulating? What do you think? Uh, well, sorry, I, I mean, I think that's a pretty broad question. I think um, some, some motivations of regulators are definitely justified. I mean, I mean, security laws exist for a reason, right? So... Uh, one of the things that the crypto industry gets a lot of criticism for is there aren't uh, like a set of like rules that govern like what types of projects are absolute scams and what projects are not. So right. uh, retail investors are just sort of left to their own tools to determine what is a scam and what is not. And in sort of like a fast moving uh, forward looking type of industry, that's really, really hard to do. So I, I think there's a decent amount of merit in trying to sort of... Um, you know, uh, to separate the shit from the gold, if if uh, that makes sense. But at the same time, I think um, it's definitely a challenging time to be uh, a crypto builder in the United States. And I think that's because, um, you know, sort of, you know, for lo lots of different reasons, right? So, uh, I mean, for example, if you sort of impose, uh, you know, onerous regulations on builders that are trying to do really interesting things, uh, even though that results in uh, investor protection at times, sometimes that results in a loss of investor opportunity. Or, um, you know, uh, but more importantly, it sort of results in a, a loss of potential for innovation, right? So if um, sort of like the access for, uh, you know, building the most productive protocols for the next, next iteration of the internet moves from, let's say, the United States to different countries, let's say, Korea or Singapore, uh, in that case, that opens up a bigger opportunity for builders abroad, but at the same time for builders in the United States, that is a big loss. And um, in some cases, like uh, sort of things that are done in the name of investor protection can be a little bit difficult to understand, right? So for example, if a project is giving up free tokens in exchange for an airdrop, a lot of them sort of avoid US-based users because they're worried that there might be a violation of security laws. But then that sort of results in opportunity cost to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars for lots of users. So um, it's it, it can be a little bit hard to understand unless like you sort of weigh, uh, weigh deep into security laws in terms of whether that's investor protection or investor uh, or profit prevention, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm in most mostly agree there. I do wonder, obviously, Mirror is a project on Terra. I'm a huge fan of it. I think we should be opening up um, U.S. equities to the globe, uh, to anyone that wants access to them. But it is a bold project to start with, uh, bring you know, synthetic stocks on the blockchain. 
did you when you went into this were you did you consider that it might ruffle feathers or is the mission of bringing these equities to anyone more important than any of that well so i mean th there are a ton of different synthetic uh protocols in the world right uh but then yeah. Like uh, most of the uh, synthetic products actually sort of wrap around, let's say, a synthetic Bitcoin or synthetic Ethereum or synthetic ERC-20s, which is like, why? Like, what's the point? Like, you can already buy these things on blockchains. Like, why create a synthetic version of them? Is, is the point to exploit the inherent uh, inefficiencies of the pegging mechanisms to create arbitrage opportunities? It wasn't like totally clear to me as to why these things were being done. Uh, one thing that's clear is that while... Um, well, one thing that's clear is that there's a lot of people that don't have access to, uh, you know, some of the most attractive asset classes in the world. Um, and I think having uh, having synthetics protocols that succinctly pegs to each one of them creates more uh, opportunity for investors around the world than sort of a synthetic protocol that does not. So um, I think as builders, we sort of have a responsibility to make sure that we increase financial access to everyone that wants it. And insofar as you're sort of fulfilling that mandate, I don't think there's any goal that is more important than doing just that. Gotcha. And then switching gears a bit, what in your in your mind, what can the U.S. do if, if they want to come down heavy on regulations, which I would not be in support of, but obviously you're not based in the U.S. You do service customers in the U.S., but you don't necessarily target them. Can the U.S. intervene more than simply blocking the front end if we can't stop these blockchains? Um. Are, are you asking me to offer strategic advice to regulators to better clamp down on DeFi? <laughs> I'm not. I'm just trying to get a sense of uh, the, the best example. I mean, I, I could do that. I could do that. It's just that I, I charge by the hour and I'm not sure if they can afford me, to be honest. Sure. The, the best example I think of is, is Uniswap. Obviously, we know the SEC is investigating them. I think it's misguided. Like you said, there are a ton of scams on the blockchain that why don't we go after them? But you can take down the front end of Uniswap. You can go after the team members here in the U.S., but the code lives on on the blockchain. I mean, do you feel Terra is in such a position that the same holds true for, for everything you've built? Uh, well, I, I don't believe that there's any, you know, serious regulatory challenges for things that Terra is, is building. Like, yeah. Um, if that was the case, I would be off handling those things instead of talking to you over a podcast. But I mean, like presumably if that was, I don't think like censoring individual front ends is something that's that's um, that's uh, highly effective because uh, if you look at things like, let's say what happened in uh, the Torrent era or free movie streaming is that if there's enough consumer demand for a particular type of good, then in that case, there's going to be a thousand, tens of thousands of different front ends, some of which are sort of based in, um, you know, are either launched anonymously or based in jurisdictions that are very highly hard to censor. So I, I, I do think, you know, um, there, there's a decent amount of work cut out for people that wants to censor these things. But I think what uh, people can do is to make it very difficult for any one of them to become highly successful, right? So for example, it's it's possible to prevent, let's say, like a Netflix of uh, the torrent world for emerging, similar to how uh, you could prevent, let's say, a Binance or Coinbase of decentralized finance for emerging. But uh, in sort of like a, uh, and this is, I think, one of the things that protocols really disrupt, right? Because you don't need to run like the most successful front end in order for something to be absolutely massive, you can have a value capture mechanism underlying all those things where the protocols themselves can uh, build a community and to galvanize a large number of people behind them. So I think we're in truly uncharted waters, so we'll have to see what happens. But I, you know, from a bunch of the thinking that I've done, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, going to be one of those things that if the protocol itself is truly decentralized, there aren't any you know, sort of centralized choke points, then uh, we've sort of set us uh, set us uh, set ourselves up for a world that is very very difficult to censor. Yeah, awesome. I think you help transition well to the the topic of decentralization. I know wow. this is something that's that's very important to you. It, it is important to me as well. I think uh, probably top of mind for you is decentralizing the validator set. Um, I think right now there's maybe between 100 and 140 validators for Terra. 
Um, it, there is some concentration in the top 10 to 15 or so in, in the, their percentage of voting power. I think the top 15 might hold around 50 percent of the voting power. But what are your plans for decentralizing that? How much of a challenge do you think that might be? Yeah, so um, I, I think decentralization comes in many different flavors. Um, but um, I, I, I think even for sort of... Um, you know, so so uh, Tendermint, which is the consensus mechanism that Terra relies on, uh, sort of has a uh, it's it's a uh, delegated proof of stake mechanism. So which means that it's sort of predicated upon like a set of very active delegates, similar to how there's sort of like a national assembly or like a congress that determines different types of consensus states um, that are quite active in sort of building on top of the blockchain, participating in governance, participating in the formation of consensus. Um, so while this is expected to scale out over time, like in the immediate short term, like growing it to, let's say, 10,000 different validators is not of uh, immediate importance. So when we say decentralization, uh, what we are most concerned with is uh, sort of the decentralization of power. So, for example, when there's uh, going to be like an important change coming to the rules of the protocol or where there's wealth generation in, uh, in the Terra ecosystem, is that wealth... Uh, is that decision-making process sufficiently decentralized? Does it have sufficient input and feedback from as many members of the community as possible? And from that standpoint, I think Terra is decentralizing quite quickly. So just about a year ago, when we were putting out governance proposals, the only people that were participating were maybe, you know, like large funds that were heavily invested into the Terra ecosystem and maybe like a few TFL employees. So that's changed rapidly throughout time. So like now we don't, even really participate in any governance dis discussions or nor do we vote on any of the proposals. And I think a lot of the funds have either divested or um, they, they're they not quite as active in sort of the, the governance discussions that are happening. But I think what we can say as lunatics is that the community that we've been able to build around the Terra, Terra ecosystem is absolutely massive. So there's a, a, you know, tens of thousands of disparate voices that are weighing in to everything between, you know, like parameter changes on the blockchain to new protocols that are launching to how the community funds should be spent. So um, I think sort of decentralizing and making sure those voices all are heard and um, are synthesized into um, you know, new directions for the protocol is step one. And step two, sort of uh, the, um, I, I wanna say like the number of validators or people that are participating in consensus is sort of like a natural secondary effect to that. Gotcha. You brought up something interesting. I'm, I'm curious. I think a lot of people are probably envious of the community your team and you have been able to build and has grown over the past, you know, six to eight months. It's been crazy to see the, the lunatics, as they're called. Can you talk about how you achieve such success in building such a strong community? I think um, Terra probably is one of the strongest communities in DeFi in general. So what do you think is the reason for that? Well, I, I think that's because it it represents one of the biggest ideas, right? So, uh, for example, um, even for me, like I participate in lots of different blockchain communities, and some of these ideas can be quite compelling and interesting. So, for example, it is quite important, and I I, I would go far as to say it's mission critical for us to have robust Oracle infrastructure that correctly re um, reports off-chain data and that brings it on to the blockchain. It is important to have extremely fast blockchains that can sort of outpace the, the rate by which Ethereum can scale. It is very important to make sure that we have um, token curated reg registries with high fidelity. It is important that uh, we have bridging solutions that can connect different types of assets across um, you know, all, all the different uh, asset classes. But I think the foundational idea that makes cryptocurrencies the most interesting is this idea of a decentralized currency. So uh, underpinning all the different applications and superior blockchain technologies that we can build is this idea that we can separate money from state. And that's the idea that Terra represents, right? The idea that in order to build a decentralized economy, we need decentralized money. And because that idea is more exciting than anything else that uh, exists in blockchains, I think that's why uh, lunatics uh, spend more, more time and more of their energies and are more excited about the vision that Terra represents than almost anything other. Gotcha. Uh, so going back to the decentralization topic, obviously Terraform Labs has had a huge hand in incubating uh, the main projects on Terra and some of the future projects coming up. 
I've heard in other interviews, you've talked about, you know, Terraform Labs needing to become credibly neutral. But when do you think the right time to do that is and to kind of step back? I think you're probably very surprised by the growth you've seen almost, you're almost a top 10 blockchain now. But when is it the right time for TFL to take that step back? Sure. Um, so by many metrics, that's already happening. So, um, you know, um, throw back to, let's say, October of 2020, the only app that was on Terra was Chai, which was a payment company that I built. Uh, maybe three months later, like in January of 2021, the only app was Mirror, uh, which was sort of our first foray into DeFi. And then maybe a few months after that, Anchor. So it was a lot of TFL projects that was leading the charge. But now, just in terms of NFT projects that have announced themselves, there's like 60 and yeah. like 10 different OpenSea competitors. Um, you know, there's, you know, dozens and dozens of different DeFi apps that are all each doing very interesting things. Um, so from that perspective, the ecosystem is already decentralizing and the market share of the innovation that TFLs bring into the table in the overall ecosystem is rapidly shrinking. Um, a lot of TFL employees are sort of splitting off into new companies to, uh, you know, build things from sort of credible node infrastructure to different dApps to, uh, you know, developer education and tooling um, uh, products on top of Terra. So uh, the company itself is already you know, quite rapidly decentralizing as well. Um, what I will say is that our mandate is quickly changing. I think one of the things that we did really well, I would say towards the end of last year was sort of like a, a app factory or crypto conglomerate type of model. So the idea was that um, in the beginning, when it was very difficult to incentivize developers to build on top of Terra versus other blockchains, we had to build lots of these things very quickly. So we set up all the processes at the firm to be sort of, um, you know, very good at executing different things at once. Um, now we're a little bit different in the sense that we don't really look to launch new projects internal to the firm. Um, you know, I would sometimes personally, you know, work with uh, people outside of the firm to do various different types of things, but that's not really what TFL does anymore. What we do is that we try to make it very easy uh, to build new things on top of Terra. And we try to make sure that we provide the right support to make sure that people are building things on, on top of Terra are highly successful. Um, so I would say decentralization is well underway. Um, and, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, the last question surrounding decentralization, uh, obviously this has been discussed numerous times and I think I've heard you speak on this as well, but, uh, about half, I think of Luna tokens are held by either investors, Terraform, Terraform labs or team members. Decentralizing the Luna token itself. I mean, I think there's two ways to do it, right? Either folks have to sell or tokens get burned. I know you've spoken about TFL potentially burning their treasury somewhere down the line, uh, but are you concerned about an outsized share of holdings in potentially insiders or VCs? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So I don't think um, like a version of the world where, uh, you know, TFL walks out with, uh, you know, like half the Luna tokens is a viable option. So yeah. we sort of designed the token economics for this uh, in a world where, um, you know, raises of this type were quite typical. So a lot yeah. of crypto companies were fundraising very similar to how, you know, startups were doing Series A, Series B, Series C types of raises. And that's how sort of the token distribution was initially designed. So, um, you know, we did like a seed raise at like, um, you know, selling like 10% of the tokens and there was like a series A type of pre-sale type of structure selling another 10%. You know, there was like a, uh, you know, pre-sale right before the launch selling a little bit more. And then we've done a couple more fundraises after that. But, um, you know, I think one of the most exciting things that I noticed in sort of uh, summer of 2020, uh, you know, during DeFi summer was a lot of developers trying to distribute tokens to their users as quickly as possible. So there wasn't a model that was around in 2017, 2018, around the time that Terra was designed. And I thought, you know, some of, some of those things would be quite interesting. So uh, we have, you know, like a couple of ideas in place where we can uh, sort of uh, spend the tokens in reserve to benefit the overall ecosystem. Some of these things have been announced, like for example, uh, Project Dawn, which sort of expanded TFL's mandate from just uh, building, you know, tooling and apps on the Terra ecosystem to uh, sort of improve the underlying technical infrastructure of, let's say, Cosmos or uh, Tendermint Consensus, as well as 
um, you know, providing subsidies and node infrastructure similar to Alchemy and Infura that uh, people get, you know, uh, sort of pro bono in the Ethereum ecosystem. So uh, those are um, some of the things that we're starting to devote resources into. Uh, there's been sort of new ideas that are being floated with, uh, let's say, using some of the, um, you know, Luna tokens either in the community pool or in Ter Terraform Labs holdings to build a sort of a decentralized uh, Forex reserve, if you will. So it's it's not so much of a, it's sort of like a community raise whereby you can, you know, purchase Luna tokens at a discount in exchange for lockup. Anybody can send money to a smart contract to be able to do this. In exchange, that money doesn't go to TFL, but it goes to, let's say, uh, like a smart contract system that is part of the Ozone uh, um, Ozone project, uh, whereby people can sort of redeem Terra stable coins against, let's say, third party stable coins or different types of cryptocurrencies, thereby providing a uh, sort of a impartial augmentation to Terra's core stability mechanism. So, um, it, you know, I, I think when we choose to use these funds, we're going to try to do this in a way that benefits the Terra community uh, first and foremost. While, of course, like, you know, living up to the legal obligations of, you know, the things that we've signed in order to get to the point that where we are. Um, and uh, once we don't need these funds and uh, the Terra project is sufficiently decentralized, we'll find ways of um, sort of not needing these funds and return them to the community in some way. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to switch gears to UST because I do have a couple specific questions there. So the first is you actually mentioned this earlier get about how important it is to get reliable oracles onto Terra. Now, I looked into TerraSwap and the UST Luna pair is, I think there's maybe $58 million in the pair. So it's on the smaller side, uh, which is understandable. It's not incentivized, et cetera. But for TerraStation, do you know what Oracle TerraStation uses uh, to pet for the, the prices of UST and Luna? Because I would it would just be hard to believe that TerraSwap could handle that heavy of a load right now. Oh, so how... Um... You know, the Terra system works is that every validator is also yeah. an Oracle. So every validator needs to submit, um, you know, every 15 seconds or so, uh, what they believe to be the correct price of all the Terra stable coins, you know, UST, KRT, blah, 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 quoted in Luna. So what this allows people to do is that, you know, every 15 seconds we form sort of a, a Luna voting power weighted av uh, median of um, you know all the Oracle prices that the validators have voted on, and then that that weighted median is considered to be the effective exchange rate of UST to Luna and vice versa. Gotcha. This pulls in data from a bunch of different things like centralized exchanges to things like CoinGecko uh, to you know uh, even TerraSwap itself. And it's, so it's interesting. I'm actually in the process of setting up a, a somewhat of an institutional validator for Terra, which I'm very excited about. Um, but can you just briefly share there, can validators pull this data from, can they pull it from centralized order books? Do they pull it from TerraSwap? Is it basically up to the validator wherever how they want to source this data from? Yeah, it's it's really up to the validator. And there's, I think, a pretty, pretty decent distribution of validators that are using different types of clients to be able to do this. Like some of them use... Um, the band Oracle clients, some of them sort of build their own. Uh, we put out a reference solution a while ago that is like kind of well maintained, but not really. Uh, so it's it's really you know fairly distributed Oracle type of infrastructure. Gotcha. And then switching gears about UST specifically. So I was trying to wrap my head around this, and perhaps you could help with the explanation. So for those that don't know. Um, UST and Luna are somewhat paired together in that uh, the peg of UST is dependent on Luna um, to stabilize the price of UST. But I was curious, the, the seniority mechanism itself is not what brings UST back to the peg. It's actually the market forces of folks selling off UST or buying pressure on it when it's under peg, etc. So can you talk a bit about where that market is made? Because it, it, when looking at UST volumes on CoinGecko and researching on TerraSwap exploring that, it doesn't seem to me that there's enough deep liquidity there to help maintain such a sturdy peg, which UST has obviously been at for since the COVID flash crash, or since May, excuse me. Uh, well, so the liquidity here that matters is Luna liquidity, not UST liquidity. And the reason for that is because uh, when you're, so, so when you're swapping UST to Luna and then Luna to UST, really the redemption liquidity that you're trading against is the liquidity of Luna. So for example, um, if you're trying to redeem UST to Luna, 
you burn a dollar's worth of uh, you burn one UST to get a dollar's worth of Luna, and then you sell that Luna in the exchange, right? So the amount of redemptions that you're able to do is really largely Luna bound. In the in the expansionary scenario, you could uh, sort of uh, burn a dollar's worth of Luna to mint one Terra USD and then to sell sell that in exchanges, um, but like like liquidity, you know, it it just matters if it's like time bound, right? So even if there's like uh, you know a small amount of liquidity that is that is happening, like e if there's like a consistent demand increase to buy UST to participate in Terra's DeFi apps or um, you know to buy NFTs or whatever that you want to do with it. Then in that case, it's a consistent reason to have that UST minted and ready so that you can fulfill that demand as, as the ecosystem increases. Um, I think it's like largely a function of uh, sort of native UST not having been listed on so many exchanges. But what's kind of incredible is that we got to like $3 billion on just Qcoin, right? Which is absolutely insane in my opinion. Um, and then with, you know, native UST support coming to a lot more centralized exchanges, I think that's... Um, you know, like a problem that's easy going to be solved. Yeah, absolutely. I know. Yeah, so what happened in May, uh, there was obviously a huge crash in the market. The overall market went down 50%. And I, I actually was quite impressed with UST dropping, I think, only 10 cents or so, which was interesting to see. And, and I think built confidence in the project. But I know some large changes were made after that just to build comfort in the community. Um, can you confirm or... I guess, deny if Terraform Labs participates at all in market making to keep UST at peg? Uh, so we we used to. Uh, now we don't really do much of that anymore. So there's like a number of large market makers that participate in stabilizing the, uh, the peg of UST. Uh, most of them, I don't think any of them have a contractual relationship with us. It's just something that they do because they feel like they can make money out of it. Um, but no, like we don't really have like, you, you know, like trading infrastructure to like buy and sell UST and blah, blah, blah. Like sometimes we would do it because, um, you know, there's like too much demand coming in for UST that we, we do need to stabilize the markets a little bit because there isn't enough UST liquidity there. Or sometimes like we would uh, fulfill like uh, OTC transactions of funds that are looking to buy and sell UST in large clips. But I, I wouldn't say that we're, like by any means, like a significant market maker in UST markets. Gotcha. And then I did notice you mentioned talking about US getting UST on more centralized exchanges. Do you have any insight on why Coinbase only has wrapped Luna, which is obviously a less secure version of Luna? I mean, it, it is very secure, but you're just taking on smart contract risk using that wrapper contract. And I think with UST, Coinbase only has wrapped UST as well. Is that right? Let me paint a picture. So please. <laughs> the, the listing manager uh, goes to the listing engineer and he's like, yo, like you got to integrate this Terra chain. But this listing engineer, like he's working remote, like maybe three hours a day. And like, he's not about that, you know, like, you know, he's, um, it's, it's pretty chill. Like, you know, integrating Terra chain, that's kind of interesting, but maybe he's like a Polkadot fan or like uh, something else. Or like, he's waiting for his like stock options to vest. It's not a knock on Coinbase, by the way, but uh, in any case, like what I'm trying to illustrate is that listing like an ERC20 asset, you can do that faster than, yeah. um, you know, setting up DevOps infrastructure and the setting up wallets to be able to launch a new chain, especially if you have, you know, the type of compliance overhead and different types of things that I'm assuming that Coinbase has. So, um, yeah, I think it was just like a way to uh, list the assets a little bit faster without having uh, engineering dependency. But I, I think that's something that will get resolved over the next couple of months. Yeah, is there anything, I mean, and I'm sure that it's very fluid, but is there anything you can share there? I'm sure a lot of folks would be excited to see native Luna listing on, on Coinbase. Oh, I'm sorry, I only leak alpha at my alpha. <laughs> gotcha, no worries. Um, so switching gears to the topic of, of Terra's future, which I'm sure is something you're much more excited to talk about in the community, wants to learn more about. And I should mention, if there are questions from the audience, you can put them in the chat. I am watching that and we'll just try to go back to everything when we get to the community's uh, questions. But um, yeah, I just want to switch gears a bit and ask about your thoughts on you know the phrase multi-chain future. So I think we all hear this a lot. It's a very, people. Most people believe that we're going to have many chains in the future. There's going to be BTC, ETH, uh, Terra, etc. But I also heard a, a counter argument to that, which which goes along the lines of, 
if you're betting on a multi-chain future, in some ways you're actually betting against technology because in the ideal world, if one chain could scale to include all of the different use cases for blockchain, whether it's gaming, finances, whatever it is, one chain should you know kind of swallow that entire market. Now maybe it doesn't end up like that and it's more of you know Android versus iPhone. But what are your thoughts there? Do you think we will live in a vibrant multi-chain future or will one, two, three chain? Um, so, I mean, so I, I, I've had iPhones in the past, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think if we lived in a world where everybody used the iPhone, I think that would be pretty freaking gross, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think it's, well, so, I mean, I, I brought this up in Masari Mainnet, but... Um, one of the things, one of the lessons that we have to relearn every bull market is this idea of block space stratification. So every block blockchain and every sort of computing system has finite bandwidth. It's just the way that these things are designed, right? If you're trying to get multiple parties to coordinate on the authenticity of transactions that are coming in from lots of different places in the world, then it just stands to reason that block space, like definitionally, is finite. Now. What doesn't make sense is that my swaps get more expensive just because there's like a colored penguin that is being sold next door, right? It doesn't make sense that my transactions shoot up from $2 to like $130. Nor does it make sense that even if it's like not an option system where the cost of transaction is increasing, it doesn't make sense for my transactions to be slower just because there's like a penguin being sold next door. So, I mean, it stands to reason that, you know, for lots of different use cases, different types of fees make sense. Uh, for different scenarios. Like for example, to buy a cup of coffee, if you have to pay more than 10 cents, then it's kind of onerous, right? Whereas if you're trying to make like a hundred million dollar transfer, yeah, maybe it's okay if you have to pay like 200 bucks in order to be able to do it. So uh, I, I think what that means is that for all these different types of use cases and um, you know, you know, different timescales, it doesn't make sense for one blockchain to be able to contain all of them. Similar to how you know, there's like multiple cities in the world which all have sort of expensive districts and, and so on and so forth. But what kind of world would it be if like the only nice place to live in was New York? And then uh, the sort of the onus of every human being was to try to get, you know, like an apartment in, in New York City. That just wouldn't really make too much sense, right? So I believe in a multi-chain future because I believe uh, that block, block space gentrification is a problem that's never going to go away. Uh, I believe that different chains are optimized for different types of use cases. And I think uh, there's going to be different types of things that connect all of these different uh, disparate ecosystems together, uh, similar to how you know, like shipping routes or uh, you know, uh, you know, airlines connect uh, a lot of these different ecosystems together. And I think Terra could be one of those things in sort of bringing a credible decentralized money that exists across all these different blockchains. But I don't think it's a winner-take-all type of situation. Gotcha. So I, I had a question from someone from my community earlier, which is, kind of speaks to what you're saying. They were basically asking, so Terra is obviously not as fast as Solana and Solana is a bit cheaper. Uh, it doesn't have the decentralization that Avalanche is going for or Ethereum or something like Bitcoin even. It sits somewhere in the middle where it's somewhere of a balance of decentralization right now and speed and cost. So can you talk a bit about where where your niche is that you're going to carve out in the future then? Uh, well, so I, I don't really think of Terra as like a layer one blockchain. So I don't think of Solana as a competitor. I don't think of Avalanche as a competitor. Uh, so to put things really simply, the one product that we really build is the decentralized stablecoin. All the other things that we built, like Anchor and Mirror, are simply features of this grander vision. So Anchor just makes it really easy to save using Terra stablecoins, earning a 20% yield on UST. Mirror makes UST the easiest conduit to be able to invest in any asset class that you want in the world. You know, different types of projects such as Nebula makes composable ETFs possible, denominated and quoted in UST. So all these things are, simply exist uh, in order to enhance the usefulness and the decentralized profile of UST. Um, our success as a layer one ecosystem so just sort of happened by accident. So Terra is, you know, today, like maybe the third largest uh, smart contract platform in the world by TBL. Uh, and, um, you know, definitely one of the largest by usership. And I think it's because like the idea of a decentralized stablecoin uh, inspired enough developers to want to build natively on top of Terra. But that doesn't necessarily, uh, that isn't necessarily what it takes for, you know, the Terra ecosystem to succeed. 
What I sort of see is a world where the Terra blockchain is bridged to Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, any type of smart contract platform where there happens to be user and developer activity. And for UST to be the de facto decentralized money that constitutes the liquidity and the use cases across all those different chains. So Solana can be as fast as they want and Avalanche can be, is, is that fast? I don't know. Like that can They're be like, that, yeah. yeah. A little more expensive and a little less fast. <laughs> yeah. The, you know, Avalanche can like rush and give out incentives as much as it wants. Yeah. Like Ethereum can have, you know, as many frogs as it wants. Insofar as they're using USD as a de facto standard for decentralized money, we win. Gotcha. And we don't win against these people. We win with them because we collaborate. So I think you'll think this next question on that note is, is a bit interesting or even funny. Um, so a very notable person in the Ethereum community, Anthony Sasato, he does like a daily podcast. And today he was actually talking about Terra. And he was saying, I think he was you know interested in the Terra ecosystem, but he was saying, in the future, he sees a world where something like Terra would, you know, either from the start, it was built as an Ethereum layer two, as a roll up or a Validium or Volition. Uh, but he also said in the future, maybe that's what Terra becomes so that you guys don't have to focus on decentralizing the validator network, focusing on security, and you can really just focus on execution on a as a layer two to Ethereum. What are your thoughts there? I mean, if a layer two could scale to handle everything you need to handle on Ethereum, why not adopt that security from Ethereum? I'm just not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, more broadly speaking, can can you talk about any integrations for UST uh, aside from like native integrations with with actual countries aside from what you've already built in Korea? Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, I'm wondering, so obviously you've built out the Chai network in Korea, which, as you said, bootstrapped the success of UST, but are there any other plans with other countries? Yeah, we. Do. so, I mean, like like last year when we were building out Chai, we spent a lot of time thinking about like which countries we could spend to and things like that, but we don't really operate at that granularity anymore. So we don't necessarily like really want uh, Chai alone to win, if that makes sense. We're really more about like making sure that apps that are using UST can be as successful as possible. So um, like I, I remain like a board member of Chai, but I don't really go to meetings or have like a good understanding of what they're doing or what they're expanding to. But what's been sort of interesting is that there's like a ton of different apps that are launching across um, lots of different places across the world that either leverage um, Terra USD or whatever native stablecoin of that country might be as well as maybe like apps or, uh, apps like Anchor. And these are sort of FinTech uh, or neobanks that uh, are well positioned to succeed in each of these countries. So for example, in the United States, there's you know Alice uh, that are developing like a neobank whereby people could deposit USD and earn interest uh, via Anchor protocol. And then there's like a debit card that also comes, comes along with it so that people can easily make payments. Uh, similar models like Seashell also um, in the uh, in the US, there's Cash DeFi, I think, based out of Canada. There's uh, Capapult uh, out of you know Sweden, Tick Money in uh, Australia. So there's a ton of different uh, apps that are um, you know leveraging payments and Anchor or some some different parts of the you know Terra DeFi stack to be able to bring the power of these DeFi applications into uh, the hands of the retail consumer. And I think that's the pretty 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 exciting. Gotcha. I saw someone asked uh, in the comment section if a UST market cap of ten billion is still possible in two months. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, so, it's one of the things that I think. Um, so, so for example, like this is a discussion that's like actively going on in the Terra community, but right now the uh, community pool that we've earmarked to burn for ozone is over four billion dollars. So, uh, if we <laughs> Even if we just print that, we'll be at like over seven, I think. Um, so like in, in these market conditions, if the question is like, can we do another three in the last couple of months? I would say it's possible. Now, the question of whether we want to fund the coverage protocol with $4 billion, I think that deserves another question. So, uh, you know, like, so yeah, I think the answer is definitely possible. Uh, the question is whether that's the most efficient use of capital. Gotcha. Uh, switching gears a bit, 
taking Terra out of it in a few years, um, which which other layer ones are you are you bullish on? Are you maybe not even invested in other ecosystems, but are you are you very involved with other ecosystems aside from Terra? And which do you think will still have the most traction in a few years? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of Solana. I think okay. um, you know there's there's a huge need uh, to be able to form sort of censorship resistance uh, consensus in real time. And I think um, the ability, uh, so sort of like a vision where sort of centralized order books can all be replaced and live on top of the Solana ecosystem is, um, you know, definitely a huge vision. And I hope that Terra USD can be an important part of uh, helping to decentralize and uh, to keep that ecosystem censorship resistant. Um, I'm a big fan of ThorChain because I believe that sort of um, the ability for a decentralized exchanges to exist without, you know, uh, sort of centralized relayers or uh, oracles or bridges. Uh, I think that's a pretty big vision. Um, I think they're just about like recovering and uh, fr from, you know, sort of the series of hacks that they had to go through. But I think uh, as an ecosystem, they're going to uh, rise stronger than, um, than, you know, what came before. They have a number of different preventative and security measures in place that's going to make it more difficult uh, for ThorChain to get hacked. Um, and, uh, of course I'm bullish on like a ton of different things that are happening in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and, um, like on my side, I'm sort of, uh, spending a lot of times like looking into NFTs and metaverses that's, um, you know, sort of like educating myself on, on the things that are type of possible here. Yeah. It's, I noticed you've mentioned NFTs a lot and I've seen so many spreadsheets, I think with listing out the dozens and dozens of NFT projects coming to Terra. What are your thoughts there? Do you think there's some... There's some hold Ethereum has over the NFT market that like an Ethereum NFT is the standard now, or do you think we're going to move away from that just as, you know, we're going to see a ton of successful NFT projects on Solana. Uh, do you think that's going to come to Terra as well? Yeah. Uh, well, so there's like 60 NFT projects that are launching on top of Terra. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, yesterday, like some guy reached out to me on Twitter and like his handle was like Terra bag of dicks or something. And just like not about bags of dicks. But I'm guessing, like, if you wanted to launch an NFT on Terra, it's like permissionless, so you can do whatever. But um, I, I, I think uh, with um, NFTs, what, what's kind of interesting is that everybody is focused on producing NFTs. Uh, but I think the bigger opportunity is sort of expanding the dimensionality by which NFTs can be uh, sort of consumed and enjoyed. So what I mean by this is, imagine that you have a Rolls Royce. Uh, you know, I, I hear these are rare. Uh, and full disclosure, I do not have a Rolls Royce. But if the only thing that you could do with the Rolls Royce is to keep it in your garage, uh, and then you wouldn't be able to drive it out, you wouldn't be, uh, the only thing that you would be able to do is to install a CCTV in your garage so that pe your friends would be able to know that you have a Rolls Royce, then I think that would significantly diminish the value proposition of owning a Rolls Royce. And that's kind of what's happening with these NFTs, right? So uh, most of most of the NFTs and you know the things that are being done is in the sort of the profile picture type of space, but really like the utility of your Rolls Royce increases if you could drive it out and like let's say you know like show it off to your girlfriend or you know um, it's like, whatever you do with nice cars like yeah. take it out for the drive or something like that. So the value of these non fungible assets increase uh, when you sort of expand the utility of the things that you could do with them. You, the value of your nice house increases on, let's say, what's like a nice place in like LA, let's say Bel Air or, or something like that. If you can throw yeah. out house parties and invite like a bunch of people so that you can show it off and, you know, you can build like a family in these houses and things like that, right? Like if, if, it, if it was just you, there's not that big of a difference between a one bedroom apartment and like a $20 million mansion in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So, um, I think what NFTs sort of represent is that, uh, you know, if they're starting to get composed with each other, they can start to break down the natural laws uh, that sort of bio that 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 sort of limit the usefulness of various different things in the real world. Because things that you build in metaverses or the things that you build online does not need to be bound by those same laws. So, for example, uh, you would be able to sort of compose different types of identities with these sort of let's say profile picture NFTs that you purchase in various different things. And then you'd be able to compose that to form your own identity that isn't bound by, you know, you know, like the genetic composition of, uh, you know, various different factors that determine 
whether you're like a beautiful looking person or whether you're tall or whether you're short, like you can, you, you would have the agency of determining your own identity versus having that dictated to, to, to you by who, by like the congenital conditions of who your parents happen to be. Or um, you, you can sort of have these property rights uh, respected across games, right? So for example, if you had like a large uh, user base of different people that sort of decided that the types of items that they hold in, in terms of NFTs are sort of property rights that need to be re respected, then game companies will have no choice but to make sure that the new games that they create respect the property rights of the items that these users already own. So if there's like, you know, 5 million users that are holding, let's say, the Loot Project tokens, for instance, and say, hey, look, if I can't wave around like my Sword of Infinity, then I'm not going to play your shitty little game. Then in that case, all the game makers in the world are going to make sure that the property rights of those game, uh, that of those items are respected. So similar to like the ICO boom of 2017, because we don't have a Lindy effect in um, in any of these sort of NFT property rights, everybody is sort of coming up with their own property system. Everybody's just busy minting their own NFTs. But sort of when the dust settles, I think there's going to be, you know, um, critical mass of uh, users that are devoted to specific types of property systems, right? In that case, uh, you're going to see content creators and, uh, you know, games and uh, other people that start to respect the property rights of these existing systems instead of trying to mint their own, similar to how different types of service providers and individuals respect the property rights of Bitcoin and existing cryptocurrencies instead of necessarily choosing to, to mint their own things. So we talk, I, I think there's been a crazy, the NFT boom has just brought everyone to talking about the metaverse and I, that's very compelling. But what do you think about real world assets? I think there used to be a large conversation around putting the deed to a house, using that as an NFT and you can track ownership and really prove that you truly own that house. I think Compound might've been looking into something like that, which is a Ethereum based money market project. Have you thought about that at all for Terra? Yeah. yeah. Um, so with some of these like real world assets uh, to NFTs types of things, I think it's going to take a few years before sort of we start to see viable proof of concepts. And the reason for that is because sort of like the legal treatments of how valid these NFTs are in sort of binding the, the sort of the bearer to the underlying uh, asset is it's going to take a little bit of time for the regulatory frameworks to develop. Right. Um, so that's not something that we're investing a ton of time into because I like to, you know, launch things and then see results right away. Uh, but yeah. I, I think it's definitely a valid effort and could lead to efficient securitization of, you know, tons of different asset classes across the world. Yeah. We are running lower on time. So if there are any last minute questions from the audience, please submit them. I only have a couple of questions left. I do see one interesting one. To uh, what are the biggest concerns you have? Is there anything top of mind that, that you think is the biggest blocker that's stopping Terra from succeeding potentially in the future? Uh, no, I think we're pretty well on track. So we're going to keep, keep, keep kicking ass and uh, you know, hope lots of you in the community join us to be able to do it. Awesome. And then uh, I would like to ask, is there one specific project you're most excited about? No, there's like lots of different projects that I'm excited about right now. Gotcha. And then the, the last question prepared, I am curious, aside from blockchain crypto, what are some of your main hobbies just in, in your personal life? Uh, so I enjoy hiking. I try to do that um, every week. Um, you know, like um, I, I, I used to be like a long distance runner, but, um, you know, I've you know, uh, gained a lot of weight while doing Terra. So that's kind of, uh, you know, a little bit harder to do, but hiking is a little bit easier. And then uh, it's sort of like a form of meditation because it helps you clear your mind. And um, it's uh, sort of analogous to the types of things that you have to do as a founder. Um, I do enjoy drinking, uh, mainly uh, whiskey is my drink of choice. So uh, yeah. And besides those things, I don't really have a ton of free time to be able to do uh, to, to be able to explore other hobbies. Gotcha. Are you going to be in any of the conferences coming up in the next few months? Uh, I don't really plan these things too far ahead, but I'll, I'll try to be in Portugal in November. Oh, nice. Or, I'm going to be at ETH Lisbon. So yeah. yeah. Sweet. Uh, that, that sounds great. 
Um, so I don't see any more questions from the audience. I know, you know, folks in my community love what you're building and they're, they're really grateful that you came on and, and I truly appreciate it as well. I learned a lot. So thank you so much, Doe. Thank you so much. Yeah, cool. So with that all in the stream, thank you everyone for watching.